Okay, welcome to part three of our lecture on health insurance. This will be our section on moral hazard, and we'll define it and talk about the role of moral hazard in insurance market. The definition of moral hazard. Moral hazard occurs when a person's behavior regarding risks and utilization is affected by their insurance coverage. For example, when I see a patient in the emergency room for pneumonia, I ask them, what does your insurance cover your prescriptions? And for instance, if they've got pneumonia, I have two choices for community acquired pneumonia. I can either prescribe erythromycin base, which is 500 milligrams four times a day for 10 days, or I can prescribe azithromycin, Zithromax. I'm sure some of you have taken it in the past. And azithromycin is uh, two pills on the first day and one pill every day for the subsequent five days. Azithromycin has much less in terms of causing side effects like a bellyache, but it costs over $100 for a course. And erythromycin base is a $4 drug at Walmart. So I contribute to moral hazard. I ask my patient, do you have health insurance? that covers your drugs. And if they say no, then I'll tell them, look, we have two choices for you. You could pay $100 for azithromycin and have less of a chance of a bellyache, or you could pay uh, $4 for erythromycin and your pneumonia would get better. Uh, you just might have some stomach cramps a little bit. It would get better afterwards. Most of the patients, you know, some say I'll pay the 100, but some say, what the heck, $96 for one stomach ache, big deal. So that's moral hazard. They would opt for the cheaper drug based on whether or not their insurance uh, covers the drug. During the recession of 2008, uh, bankers f took on way more risk because they felt that they would get bailed out. And that the more you give them insurance against bankruptcy, the different risk profile sets up. So it's not really about morality. The word got stuck to it. Uh, Mark Pauly wrote one of the first papers about uh, moral hazard in healthcare, but he, he makes the point that moral hazard is is not immoral. It's rational to respond to incentives based on what risk you face in your own life. Now, <clears throat> in American health economics, we are very aware that being insured absolutely affects the demand for medical care. The choices we make to seek care and how much that care will spend, will cost us depends heavily on whether or not we are insured. So the demand for health care is definitely price responsive. And because it is, if we offer insurance, claims will increase. There are two pieces of what drives higher claims once people are insured. There are claims for products and services that make us healthier, and there are claims for products and services that reduces uncertainty, getting more tests, but not necessarily creating health or getting second opinions, but not necessarily creating health. Insurance also drives up the demand for care that the provider thinks the patient might want if it were free, but not at full cost. So one could order an extra CAT scan or a plastic surgeon to repair a laceration out of thinking that the patient might want it if they didn't have to pay the full cost. And finally, with the extra money that insurance gives us, there can be the substitution of higher quality goods and services, higher quality drugs. Obviously, it's better not to have a stomach ache and to get azithromycin rather than erythromycin. All right, so let's draw uh, an economic demand curve to help solidify what we think is going on with the role of insurance and the demand for healthcare services. What we see here on the horizontal axis is the quantity demanded of healthcare consumption. So, and on the vertical axis is the price from uh, zero to whatever high price this is. And as a demand curve, the higher the price, the less the quantity demanded. When the price is high over here, quantity demanded is very low. And when the price is very low, quantity demanded is very high. All right, so we start off up here at the price of healthcare being equal to the marginal cost. And this demand curve is a special demand curve. This is the demand curve of a perfectly informed patient who knows everything about what this healthcare con consumption will do for them. They 
are just completely rational about what they're going to get out of this. And so if we face that customer with marginal cost, they will demand this much of the, of the service. They will demand this much of the service. If we say to that patient, aha, you have insurance, go for it. You only have to pay the copay times price. Your actual price is now all the way down here. Well, given their demand curve, what used to be a high price product now costs them copay, let's say is 10%. It costs them 10% of the former price. So this is their new supply curve that they're facing. And they shift their consumption all the way up from low to high. And this is the increase in the quantity demanded because of insurance. This is moral hazard in action. Because they are insured, they use more services. Now, if I draw their price elasticity to be relatively elastic, moral hazard really makes them change their behavior a lot. If I draw their moral hazard, their, their demand curve to be less elastic, this is an inelastic demand curve, then the moral hazard is smaller. The amount that their price responsivity makes them move is less severe. Inelastic, remember that uh, inelastic has an I in it, which is a vertical line, and inelastic demand curves look like vertical lines because of the I. And elastic demand curves uh, have an E in it, which has horizontal uh, lines here in the E, and so a perfectly elastic demand curve is very, very horizontal. Okay, so moral hazard uh, is very big when demand is elastic. Moral hazard is very small when demand is inelastic. Should toothpaste be insured? So toothpaste is something with a what we think is a relatively inelastic demand. Everybody who has teeth should be insuring their, uh, should be brushing their teeth every day. So we think that there won't be much moral hazard in it. But from an economics perspective, we thought that insurance was there to send money from yourself to yourself because you were facing uncertainty and the need to brush your teeth is not uncertain. So economists kind of have a professional problem with people who say we want to insure things that we know are sure things like toilet paper. We thought that insurance should cover emergency things, uh, things where there's no discretion over it. And if you know you're going to have to pay for it, it's discretionary and you should just pay for it. So toothpaste is not on our list. The other thing that's a reason not to insure toothpaste is that whenever you send money to the insurance company and then give it back to the customer, it's loaded. You have to pay the industry to move money in that circle up to their, their bank account and back to you. And that's a load. And that load can be 25% or more. So even though for the customer, insurance reimbursed toothpaste looks like it's free, it's in the premium. And every time we add uh, one of these services to the in insurance uh, coverage, uh, you will end up paying these loads as you send your money up to the insurance company. The insurance companies love it. Every time they, they add more services, as long as everybody in industry is doing it, they get more money in the bank. But for the consumer's perspective, buying your insurance, uh, buying your toothpaste with loaded dollars is, is a worse deal than just buying your toothpaste. You know, for, for some of you, you will face state legislation that, that, and it certainly came up with the Affordable Care Act that we should ensure preventive services. We should all put in the pool that, that buys everybody preventive care like colon cancer screening uh, vaccines and even family planning, that even though the need to prevent pregnancy is a sure thing for men and women, under uh, political pressure and political considerations, as well as public health considerations, a lot of people in public health saw insurance as a way to get merit goods supported. Let's go back to our notes about moral hazard. Mark Pauly, uh, my old economics professor, made the point that it's possible for a population to become worse off because they become overinsured, they become too insured. 
Now, when we offer a population insurance, they get something good. They get utility because they are facing less of their risk premium. They don't like variable expenses and insurance gives them that benefit of having much more planned and smooth expenses. And so they're happy to pay the cost uh, of that uh, service of insurance to eliminate that burden. However, what goes into the cost that they didn't expect and didn't want to pay for is the overutilization of that new moral hazard based care from their pool. If you have just become insured or your population just becomes insured, you end up ex being excited that you now suddenly don't face uncertain expenses, but your premium doesn't just simply go up by the load, it goes up by the load and this extra cost from having to pay for the moral hazard increases in utilization from all of your, your fellow citizens. If we draw this again, we can uh, look at uh, this from the following perspective. Uh, when we were paying out of pocket, we weren't insured on this elastic curve. This is the, the quantity demanded. We were all up here and then we became insured and we suddenly moved out our quantity demanded out to here. Now what I've gone ahead and drawn on this curve is this red triangle, which I'm gonna call the dead weight loss. Because I insisted and assumed that this demand curve is the demand curve of fully informed and rational patients who know exactly what they're getting out of this healthcare utilization, the value of these units is the area under the curve. However, the full rectangle of all of this cost times all of this quantity, this big rectangle, is the cost to society to produce these units. The price is equal to the marginal cost if society is going to be all the way out here if this quantity demanded. This big rectangle is the cost to make it, but it's only valued up until the demand curve. The value of this service uh, is not as much as its cost, and the deadweight loss is economic productivity that has actually been wasted because this person used more than, than in excess of, of price equals marginal cost. So this deadweight loss be, can become so big that it can make a society worse off to become insured unless somebody comes in and tries to find ways to increase the copay or do some other gatekeeping to try to hold back on this moral hazard based utilization. So generations of, of American health economists have been frankly uh, paranoid about the size of this triangle and how bad it is going to be for our society. Obviously inelastic demand curves have a smaller dead weight loss, but it's hard to make demand curves turn inelastic. And so, so much of uh, American healthcare policy has been about trying to restrain utilization using instruments like copays and gatekeeping. And we will have a lot to say about that later in the course. We will cover this particular problem of restraining dead weight loss uh, as we go through the course. I'm just foreshadowing it right now and giving you a picture of it. So when you want to remember what dead weight loss is, the top of the triangle is the, the cost to society. The bottom of the triangle is the value of the units transacted. So dead weight loss is the difference between the total cost of supplying quantity Q, that's the, the top of the triangle, and the total benefit of consuming quantity Q, that's the bottom of the triangle. I want to talk about uh, one of the first big American experiments in moral hazard control, which is called the, the RAND uh, Health Insurance Experiment. This was an important experiment in moral hazard control because we wanted to know, you know what would happen in real life to people's healthcare consumption if we changed their co-pays. Deductibles, co-insurance, and co-pays are the tools that we have. So in the RAND health insurance experiment, the investigators led by Joe Newhouse randomized individuals to various uh, experimental treatments. And what we found in the RAND health insurance experiment was that people uh, do use less medical care uh, when their copays go up. Insurance does create moral hazard. But I want to notice this, that when we put people at risk by 
bumping up their co-payments, they forgo both the good and the not so good care. The less valuable care and the more valuable care was forgone and given up in equal measure. We don't have a way to have people be exposed to higher prices and they only give up the wasteful stuff. They tend to give up the life-saving stuff just as much uh, at the end of those co-payments. Now, the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, as you'll read in your textbook, was not large enough to f see anybody die from the lack of health insurance or coverage. Uh, it showed no difference in health care outcomes, but again, it was a, a sample that was not large enough to show that. But just for the, the main result that you'll see in your textbook and in all your reading, they randomized groups into free, everything free, no co-pays at all. Another group that paid 25% copay, another group that paid 50% copay, another group that paid a 95% copay. They were paying almost full price up until a stop loss of, of about $2,000, and then they became insured again. And then there was one with a deductible. So the group that uh, had the free care, they had the highest likelihood of any utilization. And the group that was paying 95% copay had the lowest utilization. Uh, more admissions in the group for whom it was free. These are hospital admissions. It should be, you know, an emergency or something. And yet people with free care were uh, admitted to the hospital uh, almost 25% uh, more than the group that had to pay. And at the end, all of this multiplies together. And so the, 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 the net indemnity uh, the medical expenses of the free group was was larger, $777, than the 95% uh, out-of-pocket group. So you can see the size of the moral hazard in the Rand Health Insurance Experiment was about uh, 50% of the 534 added on. So 1.5 times as much medical spending uh, if you make care free as opposed to when you use co-pays. Go back to the, the reading. It's covered here in the, the Rice and Unruh textbook. A couple of good pages about the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. Uh, and we can discuss it more during one of our interactive sessions. So this will be the end of part three, and then we'll come back and finish off some concerns about group insurance in the part four of the lecture.